So welcome to the overtime edition of CIS 118 Web Development and Design Foundations. And this is a continuation in chapter nine. We had gotten pretty well through most of our homework and the hands-on exercises, but we had left off with hands-on exercise number five, which asks us to generate the HTML necessary to create that table that you see in figure 9.34 on page 438 of the eighth edition of the book. So I'm going to run you through that. We ran out of class time to do that, but I'm going to run you through that and post that as a second portion to today's recorded lecture. So you should see my Dreamweaver interface here on the share screen. And I'm going to go over here and open up where I left off. Well, you know what, I'm not. I'll just start a whole new file. So file, new, HTML, and then create, and then I can um, go to code view, and I'm looking at the HTML that's created by Dreamweaver to do that. And inside the body of my page, I'm gonna create a form. So I have to, have a text box that's going to hold a name, an email. I'm going to have a field set that's going to hold a bunch of check boxes, which can be all selected or none selected or anywhere in between. Then I'm going to have another field set that has a cluster of radio buttons, and radio buttons, of course, are unique in that um, only one can be selected at a time. And then I'm going to have a text box or a text area along with. Uh, a submit and a reset button on the form. Okay, so we come down here in the, well, I, I guess in the title of the page, it's just gonna be a form, right? So our title should be probably music survey. And then down in the body, we're gonna have a form. And, oh, where do I wanna put that? I guess I can leave it in the body. But I also want to make sure that I style that thing appropriately. So you know what? Let me set up some CSS here in the head that's going to actually create the style that I need for that particular form. So this is embedded CSS and that it's up in the header of the web page rather than external sheet and rather than inline that is provided in the body of the web page. So I'm gonna have a opening style tag. Let me go back here, sorry, opening style tag. And then I'm gonna to have to close that at some point. So let me do it now while I'm thinking about it. And Dreamweaver will automatically fill in for me or provide suggestions for uh, property value pairs. And then inside here, that looks like an aerial font. So let's put for the form, that's my selector. And then inside, these curly braces would be all the styles that I want to apply to the form. So how about font family? And then let's just put Arial, semicolon terminates that particular property value pair. And then how about font size? Uh, what could I have there? I'm just gonna put 90% for Grins. You could, now let's put 100%. I just want to put things in here for the CSS rules that you would want to modify later particularly if you're gonna style something for a mobile device. So it looks like there's a little bit of padding. So padding left, and then a colon, and then how about just five pixels, not a lot. And then top margin, let's do a margin at the top. Margin top, um, how about 10 pixels? Okay, so that'll take care, PX. So I'll take care of like representative CSS for my form. Oops, semicolon, there we go. And then what else should I deal with here? Probably the labels I'm gonna use on them. Um, the legend, looks like the legend is in bold, right? It's part of the field set. So first let's put uh, on our label selector, Let's display these in block format. So display colon block, semicolon. 
and then the next one would apply to, to both the legend and the label. So I separate these two selectors by a comma, legend, label, and what do I want to do here? I just want it to be bold. So font weight, and then a colon, bold, semicolon, and then close that rule. And then my field set, uh, I don't know, maybe what is that, 500 pixels? And again, you, you wouldn't have to provide all the CSS here to style this form, but I want you to get the habit of using CSS to do so. So while I, I guess I would not have expected to see that in your submission uh, on your own, right? Um, I'm trying to illustrate the proper way to approach this design. So it would be field set. And then inside it, I can specify the width and let's go 500 pixels just for grins. We can play with it later if we want to change it. And then uh, margin, let's go with 10 pixels and, and then zero. And I don't have to put a PX, just zero will do the job. And then I'll take care of that one. And then finally, I've got a uh, text area, right? Uh, text box so it'd be text area and then also I've got the drop down list that's above it so that's a select um, select element and then inside those I also want to specify that they're going to display in block format and then uh, let's put Want some spacing between them. So let's put margin, bottom, and then 10 pixels, maybe. So we could do this all in line, or we could put breaks and such to space these uh, form controls on the form, but it's better to style it with CSS. And if you're not happy with it, you can just change your CSS, particularly if you've got an external sheet that's gonna style a whole bunch of forms for consistency, they'll all be formatted and essentially painted by the browser the same way. Okay, so I, I think I'm happy with my CSS that I'm gonna use for this form. So now down in the body, I'm gonna actually put in my music survey. So that looks like a heading element above the form. So let's type in a heading one, and then let's call it music survey. And then close that heading. And then now I'm going to have to have my form. So here's my form element, my form tag. And in the form, I have to specify the method it's going to use to send the information off to the server. Post is the preferred method. And the action is going to be send it to the publisher's website. And they have a little server script running out there that will take the information that you package up out of your form and send off to it and it just echo prints it, it just spits it out and validates the function of your form. So that site is http forward forward slash web, web dev basics dot net forward slash scripts forward slash demo dot php and that's all in double quotes. And then that closes my um, form tag, but again it's container tag so I have to close it. So let's do that now while I'm thinking about it. And of course, Dreamweaver does that for me. It'll auto-complete for me. So, okay. So now I'm ready to actually put content into my form. So the first thing is going to be a, a text box for the name and then a text box for the email. So indent a little bit just to show that these are all part of the same form. So label... And I, didn't, I wouldn't have to use the label tag or the HTML element label. I could, if I wanted it to be bolded or whatever, I could uh, specify font weight and such. But the nice thing about using the labels is you can give them a name that you reference here in the, using the for attribute, and then you tie the actual text box or the entry to that label. So if people are using assistive technologies, if it's gonna be a, a text-to-speech reader, for instance, it would explain to someone who needed that support what that particular input area was used for. So we've got our label tag, and then we have to give it a name. 
So for equal, and this would be the ID that is used on the page for that particular form control. So they have to match. Let's just call it name. And then inside the, um, the label tag, we have to put what's going to be displayed on the screen. So it's going to be name. Uh, do this right. Nope, I'm missing my equal sign. And of course, Dreamweaver was letting me know that with uh, with the red line. Okay, so label, and then this is my ID name. I've got it in, whoops, that's what's wrong. It's supposed to be double quotes, not single quotes. Okay, so there's my label. And then now I actually put what's gonna be displayed on the page. So it'd be name, colon, space, and then close that label. So what do you immediately follow the label with? The form control, the input element. So now it's gonna be input tag, and then I have to make sure I use the same name, but first let's define what type of form control it's gonna be. So the type is text, that has to be contained in double quotes, and then the name is what um, gets associated with the value that's submitted to the server. It's like a variable name. When you actually run this script, it will spit out whatever you provide here is the name of this form control or this input element. And we've decided to call it, just call it name, right? And then the ID, which should match the name. It's, the, it's a reference to the same feature on the page, but the ID is the reference that you can use within the page with your HTML and CSS, whereas the name field, again, is what gets sent off to the server to identify to the server what this particular form element or form control is, but they have to match. So type equal text, name equal name, ID equal name, and I think that's all I have to worry about. So there's my first um, form control, my first input field. So let's save this thing out. I'm gonna save this one as because I started it from scratch. So we'll call this one uh, 118, and this is chapter nine, and this is hands on five. There we go. So now let's take a look at it, what it actually looks like in the browser. Uh, hit the live view tab, and so far so good, All right? I've got my name, and then I've got my text box underneath it. Okay, so far so good. Go back to code view. Now what do I have to do? I have to add one for the email, so I'm just gonna copy and paste, and I'm gonna change the label now. This isn't gonna be name, this should be email, right? So let's call it internally email, and let's put on the screen e-mail, isn't that an uppercase? Yes, so e-mail, colon, and then close the label, type is text, name is email, and ID is email. Notice the ID must match the one you specify here with the for attribute in the opening label tag. Okay, so far so good. Now what do we have to do? We have to do a field set, and it also has to have a legend that says select your favorite type of music. So first we have this container tag, a field set. So there's my field set, and because it's a container, I'm gonna have to uh, close that field set. So let's do that now while I'm thinking about it. So that closes the field set, and then after we open that field set, we've got a legend. So let's provide that legend. And the legend text is, as it appears on page 438, it's select, S-E-L-E-C-T, select your favorite types of music, okay, colon. Is there a colon there? There is, okay. So that concludes my legend, so let's close that. And now I have to actually put a whole bunch of form controls that are text boxes. So let's associate a label with each one of those, and let's indent to show that they are part of this field set. So you use the label to provide emphasis, and you also use the label so that particular 
label is attached to that particular form control or input element. And then the, the text to speech readers can uh, use assistive technologies to make that fields function clear to folks that need that kind of support. So it's going to be label. And then in this one, we're just going to provide the check boxes, right? So they're because we've already identified it as in the legend, your favorite types of music. So following the label, we now need the form control that's the checkbox. So that means we use the input tag, the input element, and then type equal, and these have to be in quotes, checkbox. So there's a checkbox, then we have to give it a name. That's what's sent off to the server, and let's just call it pop. It's gotta be enclosed in uh, double quotes. The ID should match. And that's just a way to refer to that particular element on the page with CSS or HTML. And then because it's a checkbox, the value that you would send over to the server, it's either on or off, right? It's like a wall switch. It's either yes or no. So the value is yes if that thing gets checked. And then uh, what the user actually sees on the form, pop. And then we close our label tag. There you go. So that's the first label. So let's save this thing. And then let's go up to live view and is, does it look the way it's supposed to? Well, yeah, so far so good. That looks exactly like the form there on page uh, 438. Let's go back to our code view. And now inside this field set, I'm gonna have several different checkboxes, right? How many do I need? I need one, two, three, four, five more. So copy paste, copy, and paste, 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 one, two, three, four, five, I think I need a total of six there. And the reason that Dreamweaver's complaining is because I've got duplicated IDs and field names. So they're all check boxes and they all have a uh, part of a label, but the names are gonna change here. So let's go from pop to classical, ID has to match, classical. Still it's an on and off switch, so it's still a yes if it's checked. Only what the user sees on the form is typed in between the label tags. And then pop, classical, what's the next one? Rock, what's the next one after that? Folk, the next one after that? Rap, and then other. So wrap and then other. And then now let's make the appropriate changes in the ID. So the ID is rock. And then what the user sees on the form, rock. And then folk, change the ID, change the text that's actually displayed on the form. And then wrap, 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 and then other, other, other. So there is my cluster of check boxes in this field set. Save it up here. That's my uh, immediate save icon in Dreamweaver. Go to live view and well, there it is. So far so good. So now let's go back to code view. And we have another field set. This time is going to have radio buttons. So let's just kind of copy. Well, let's not copy it. Let's just put another field set though. Field set, and then we have another legend. And then this time the legend says, how often do you purchase music CDs? So how often? It says select how often, doesn't it? it does, it says select how often. Select how often um, you purchase music CDs. And then that closes my legend. And then now let's close this field set. Okay. Now I actually have to put in the form controls. These are all input elements that we should also, we should also label. So put a label. And then we're gonna have a closing tag. And then inside it, we're actually gonna have the form control. And these are all, so let's use the input 
element, the input tag, and these are all what type? Radio buttons, right? So in double quotes, you specify radio, and then we have to give it a value that would be sent over should that item actually be checked, sent over to the server. So we have to put that in quotes. Let's call it weekly. Um, and then whether it's checked or not, we're not going to have it. So we could, well, let's do this. If we wanted to have the first one selected when they enter the form, we could use this checked attribute and then put in quotes checked. That'd be like a, a default choice that could be made. So input type radio value weekly. Do I want it checked? Yes. Now I actually have to give these a name. So let's actually put the name in here. Let's be consistent. Let's put the name after the type. So name equal, since this relates to the frequency of purchase, let's call it frequency. So name is frequency. And then um, we also have to have an appropriate ID. Now, because these are separate controls, we should have an ID that identifies this as a weekly purchase. So ID equal, how about purchase weekly? Okay, so Dreamweaver is complaining about something. What did I mess up? Label, close my label, input. Oh, I forgot to close my input element. There we go. So does that make sense? It's an input, a form control, input element, type is radio. We have to give it a name, frequency, that makes sense. ID identifies that particular item, so that would be purchase weekly. And then the value that gets sent over to the server would be the text string weekly, and then I have it checked by default is like a default radio button when they open it up. Now, how many other radio buttons do I need? I need three more buttons that have frequencies of a few CDs each year, monthly, and never purchase. So these all have to be part of the same field set. So let me copy and then paste these guys. One, two, three more. Now, it's complaining, Dreamweaver's complaining because I have all the same ID. But understand, checkboxes work differently from radio buttons and that checkboxes can be none checked, all checked, or anywhere in between. Radio buttons either unchecked or just one. So there can only be one, just like the buttons on a radio, like the presets on a radio. You can't actually listen to one, one, one station at a time. So they actually all have, of course, the same type, but the name is all the same as well. The name is frequency. Why? Because only one of those can be returned over to the server for processing. The difference is the value that gets sent over and then the ID that identifies that form control element. So it won't be purchase weekly. Uh, after purchase weekly, it would be, uh, that would be a few CDs each year. So let's call it, uh, what do you want to call it? How about purchase few? Purchase few, that would be my ID, and my value would be what gets sent over. So how about uh, a few each year? Does that make sense? Okay, so that's also what gets displayed, right? The value that you put there. And then what's the next one? Uh, the next one was occasional or something like that. Nope, that was monthly. The next one was monthly. So like ID, let's call it monthly. And then the value should be monthly because that's what gets sent over and that's also what gets displayed in the radio button. Okay, and let's get rid of these checked. Let's have the first one be the default. If it gets checked, then we'll actually have a value associated with that. So let's get rid of this, and then let's get rid of this. Okay, and then you notice Dreamweaver is only complaining about the last one now, because this is again an ID that we got to change, and the last one is just never purchase, right? So how about never? is our value and our ID, does that make sense? Or how about purchase never, let's be consistent. Purchase never is our 
ID and the value is what gets sent over and what gets displayed. So let's just put never. So does that match the form? Look at the values. Weekly, a few each year. Actually, it's a few CDs each year, isn't it? Okay. Good, 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 good. That'll work. All right. So these are the values that get sent over if these radio buttons are actually selected and they are associated with this particular name, frequency is like the variable and then the value would contain what gets sent over to the server. The ID is a way to flag that particular form control on the form. And what am I, oh, you know what? Boy, sorry, glaring oversight. So again, uh, the value is what you want displayed on the form. So you have to put it between the label tags. So that would be weekly or it was purchased weekly, not just said weekly. Weekly, and then the next one was a few CDs each year, right? CDs, that was lowercase. A few CDs each year. I'm just trying to reproduce that table. And then what did I call it here? The value is monthly, and that's what should be displayed monthly. And then this one is never, okay. So notice it's all color coded there in Dreamweaver, that's nice. So let's save it, let's go to live view. Is that what it looks like? Well, there you go. And the default selection is weekly. If I didn't wanna have a default selection, I would just remove that attribute in the uh, form control. Uh, do you not like that? Maybe you don't like it. I just wanted to show you that you could have the default feature. It's actually, oh no, it is, it is displayed with the second item selected. See if I, you look at figure 9.34, Maybe that should be the default. So let's do that. Let's make that change. So I'm going to take this and cut it out. And then I'm going to put it in here for a few each year. Paste that back in. And now save that. And now look at it. And now it matches the form that we see on figure 934. Okay, back to the code view. So I've got both field sets done my check boxes, my radio buttons. What's left? I've got a drop down list, or a, which requires that I use a select um, element on the page and then define options for those items in the drop down list. And then I have a text area. And then I'm done. So here we go, past the field set. Um, now I'm going to have to have a label above the drop down list that says select the locations you listen to music. So let's do that. So label, and then let's give it an ID that could be associated with that particular group. So four equal, what do you think we want to call it? How about locations? And then that takes care of the label field. And then select the locations you listen to. I don't know why they have music capitalized, but they do, colon. And then let's close our label. Okay, so I have an ID associated with the label, and then I've defined the text that's going to be right above that drop-down list, so not to actually do the drop-down list. So that requires that I use a select element, and then in this case, it looks like it wants me to display three rather than just have a default or one selected, and then you actually have to click on it to, to drop down in the list to select the item. So let's then say, okay, there's going to be three displayed out of the gate, so you put in quotes, size equal three, and then now we associate the name with um, the identifier we chose for it, locations, and of course the ID must match at this point. So the ID is locations, that's the one we chose to refer to it in the label. Okay, so I've got the size of three, I've got the name, locations, I've got the ID locations, and if I want to display more than one, I have to use the multiple attribute in this select element, and then equal, and then I have to put the uh, keyword multiple in quotes. Now that closes my select, um, or rather, it, that finishes the opening tag of my select. So now let's actually close this drop-down list, close the select tag. It's a container tag. 
So now inside this container, this is where I have to worry about the options that are going to be available on that form. And it looks like I've got three, and it says at home, in the car, and anywhere with an MP3 player. So I'm going to have to have three options. So I have an option tag, and then I have to associate with that a value, and that would be what's sent over to the server. So value equal, and then the first one's at at home, and then I actually have to type the text to have it appear on the form, pass the opening option tag, and it would be at home, and then I have a container here, so I gotta close my option. So now I've got two more, correct? So paste, paste, let's get rid of the extra space. I want you to get in the habit of indenting to make code readable. The browser, of course, ignores it, but I think it's pretty clear based on the use of indentation which of these components, these um, form controls, belong to each other. So what do I have to fix here? So now the option for the second choice is not at home. The option is in the car. So let's put a value of in car. That's what's going to get sent over to the server. And then this is... Also, likewise, what you would put on the form for the user to see, but let's spell it out. So, in the car. And then the third option was anywhere, right? So, let's have a value of anywhere. And then what does the user actually see for the anywhere option? It would be anywhere. And then the form has, in quotes, MP3 player. I'm sorry, in parentheses, right? Is that, is that what's on the form? It is. Okay, so let's save this. Let's go over and take a peek at it. Well, yeah, that, that looks like what it's supposed to look like. I can select on these things. And then there's my radio buttons, and I can change those. Notice they're mutually exclusive. And then I can select any or all of my checkboxes. Okay. And then I can type my name in here, and I could type in an email. Oops, I inadvertently deleted stuff. Gotta watch that backspace. Okay, so we're back. So now let's go, let's save this before I mess anything else up. Let's go back to code view. And then what's left to do on this form? Just the text area, right? So we have to have a label here that says select the locate. No, I'm sorry, right below that. The label says what does what role does music play in your life? So I have to have another label tag. So label, and then I follow the label with well, let's give it an ID because then I can tie the text area to that label. So for that's my attribute, and what do you want to call it? How about role? And then now we actually type the text for this label, and it would be, what role does music play in your life, question mark. And now let's close that label. And then after the label, we have to provide the text area that's associated with the label. So we use the um, HTML element text area, and then we should associate it with that ID that we had defined up in the label. So ID equals, it has to match, role. And then we have to give it a name that's gonna be used to identify the content to the server. So it should match, name equal role. And then um, close that, and it's not text. How did that happen? It's text area, right? And then I have, because it's a container, I actually have to have a closing text area. And I have to do a, a couple other things in here first. So I've got my text area uh, form control, and I've got my ID associated with the label above it. And then I've got a name that I'm going to use to identify that value that gets sent in to the server. But... It looks like I need to structure this thing to have a certain number of rows, and it looks like a limited number of columns. So for sure, 
we should put rows in here. So let's format that past the ID. So it would be rows equal, and then in quotes, three. And let's say if I wanted, what's a reasonable number of columns? Say columns equal 60. You would put that in quotation marks. Save this out. Take a look at it. Well, there you go. So that looks pretty good. I think that takes care of it, except all that information I'm going to collect, where am I going to send it? The server. How am I going to send it to the server? Uh, with a submit button? Do I have a submit button? No. What if I want to start over and reset? Do I have a reset button? No. So that's what's missing at the bottom of the form. Before you close the form, I have to have a, a form control that um, creates a submit button. So it's input, right? An input element, and then type equal, and then in quotes, submit. And then the value that gets sent would be, or the value of the button, right, would be submit. And then that takes care of the submit button. And then if I want to reset another input element and type equal reset, and then now I'm done. At least I think I'm done. Let's look. All right. Except these things should be underneath and not to the not to the right of the text area. So, oh, let's see. Label, closed my label, created my text area, closed my text area. Well, if I want it below there, I just put a break. Save that out. Now let's go look. How come it didn't do that? It's not, hmm. Well, everything looks good with the exception of the submit and the reset. Let's go back into code view and look, let's look what I did with my, oh, that's what's going on. So I was going to say I screwed up something in the formatting. So let's go back up to the style tags in my header, right? This is where I had my embedded CSS. And I forgot to close the field set selector. So you guys, this is recording as I work through it. At least I hope to God it is. So you should uh, have seen that I just made that fix, right? So now that I did that, I actually don't need to put that break in here. I don't think I do. So now let's save it and see what happens once I fixed my CSS to style the text area. Oh, so much better. Okay. So you see how convenient that is to put your style rules up here. And then if you want to paint with broad strokes, it's easy to do so. Even easier if you put it in an external sheet. So that takes care of our hands-on exercise number five. So that was a bit of work, right? So what do you have left to do as homework out of this chapter's assignment? I want you to do the focus on web design. And I want you to submit a separate HTML that's going to have the work done in that problem. And it's, I've got the instructions that state uh, you doing that as well. Yeah, as far as the questions, um, the hands-on exercises one through five, it's fine by me if you want to put in an HTML file and just put them all head to tail. Multiple forms, every question in there could be uh, a separate table in your single HTML file and then submit a Word document or some such to give me the multiple choice and short answer questions. Uh, they apply your knowledge and then the um, find the bug, right, that we already worked through in class. So that's it for the homework exercise. As far as the case study goes, the running case, as I've already stated in the other uh, part of the recording, there are only two files that you submit this week as evidence that you completed the running case. And the first is a slight modification to the Pacific.css um, uh, style sheet. And then the other is the creation of a brand new reservations web page, which we had links to in our um, other pages. To date, we just didn't have a page for it to go to. So if I were to actually open up our our web page for the Pacific Trails Resort from last time. This is as far as we got, right? So we had a home page, and we could click on yurts and get there, and then we added the table uh, for that last week, and then our activities page has not changed. We now have to add a reservations page. 
So the first thing we need to do is modify the pacific.css style sheet. So I am on page 445 in the eighth edition of the book. This is chapter nine, hands-on case study for Pacific Trails Resort. And task one just says copy over files from last week. Task two says make the following modifications to your CSS. And task three is create the reservations page using the form that is depicted in figure 9.42. That's a wireframe. And, and like all web design, it's a good idea to just kind of sketch what it should look like before you start trying to generate some HTML or CSS. Okay, so let's open up the style sheet here. So here's my style sheet. And I already worked ahead a bit and made the modifications because I'm trying to make this as short as possible. And my recommendation was to actually add things as we work through the remaining case study chapters just above the media queries that we placed in our CSS because it, it's easier for me when I grade your work to actually look for it in a certain spot. So there's, there's very little to modify here. It says create a label element selector, which I just did right here. You guys should be able to view it. Create a label element selector to float to the left with block display. So float left display block. Set the width to 8 EMs and 1 EM of right padding. So width is 8 EM, padding is right, 1 EM. Notice these are all the property value pairs. They're all terminated with a semicolon and enclosed in the curly braces following the selector. And then for item two, under task two on page 445, it says configure the input element and the text area element selectors with block display and one EM of bottom margin. So I put both of those selectors separated by commas, and then in the curly braces, display block margin bottom one EM. And then finally, under item three, task two, it says create an ID called my submit with a 10 EM left margin, which we'll use that rule later on to space the submit button appropriately from the left on our form. And again, if we write these rules in our CSS, we can style our form or several forms later in a consistent fashion. So that's the reason for doing that. So these are the, um, the three style additions to our pacific.css style sheet for the running case in chapter nine. So I've got that set up and I can get rid of this Hands on five business. Okay, so now I actually have to create a reservations page, and it says to start with the home page and modify that because, of course, it's already got the header and the footer and it's already got the nav area set up. So let's do that. So let me open up the, the home page. And is it our home page? I don't know. Let's go to live view. Yep. Okay. So that's our home page. That's good. So let's go back to code view. And this is now Pacific Trails case study chapter nine solution. And it's not the home page. We're not actually changing that this week. This is the new page called reservations. Make sure you spell it right because we already have links down here that refer to it, right? This was a dead hyperlink. It didn't go anywhere. Well, after this exercise, it will. It'll go to this page we're about to create. So what do you want to call this page? Well, it says change the page title to an appropriate, using an appropriate description, right? So I'm looking at item one, task three, page 445. So instead of it just saying Pacific Trails, Resort, it should probably say something like Pacific Trails Resort Reservations. Okay, I'm happy with that. Nothing else has to change up there. And then it says delete all the HTML tags and content within the main, except for the heading to element and the text with it. So let's come down here. Here's our body. And then here's our heading one. Um, here, I'm sorry, here's our main. That was our header. Here's the main. Under the main, under the heading, so let's grab all this other stuff all the way down to the closing main tag. Boom, it's gone. 
Okay, flipping the page, I'm now on page 446 of chapter nine, item three. It says, replace the text and the heading two tags with reservations at Pacific Trails. So let's do that. So, reservations at Pacific Trails. Okay, that was simple. Now what do we have to do? It says in task, um, Task number three, item four, says configure in a heading three element on a line under the heading two that has contact us as the text. So let's do that. So that's heading three, and then contact us, and then let's close that. And then underneath it, I'm now on item number five. It says prepare to code the HTML for the form. Begin with a form element that uses the post method and the action attribute to invoke the server side processing that we're gonna use from the publisher site. And then the rest of these um, item number six through 12, create those form controls, or at least the majority of them. So let's set that up. So the first thing we need is a form element, and then we have to specify the method. So it'd be method equal, in quotes, post. And then action refers to the script and where to find it on the publisher server, HTTP colon forward forward web dev basics, B-A-S, got to spell this right, uh, web dev basics, okay, dot net forward slash scripts forward slash pacific dot PHP. That's the one they tell you to use there right on the page, right? So that's my opening form tag, and I'm gonna close it now while I'm thinking about it. Okay, and now within the form, everything that you see in figure 943 needs to be placed inside this form container. Okay, so the first thing we gotta do is, uh, well, I'm looking at it, first name, last name, email. So we've got some text boxes that we have to use. So it says, configure the form control for the first name information. So this is item number six on page 446 under task three. It says, create a label element that contains the text first name, and then create a text box named my F name. So it, and then it tells you to link the text box to the label with that for attribute. So the people who use the text to speech readers can uh, have an explanation of what those fields are actually supposed to do. So let's do that. So we're gonna indent a couple of places and I'm gonna put my label and then it's gonna be four equal and I'm gonna use the names that they recommended I use here on in the instructions. So it's uppercase F, uppercase N name, my F name. And then that closes the, uh, the I'm sorry, that's the opening label tag. And then I actually have to close the label. So let's do that while I'm thinking about it. And then what does what actually gets displayed on the form is what I type in between the label tags. And that would be, notice it's got an asterisk over there to indicate that it's, it's required. I'm working ahead a little bit. I'm gonna put it in here while I'm typing. So asterisk and then first name. And then following the label is where we actually put the form, um, the form control, the input element. So input. And then what type of input is it? It's gonna be a text box, so type equal, in quotes, text, text, I have to spell it right. And then I have to use the ID that I just defined above in my, or rather to the left in my label. So ID equal, and it's gotta be the same, my F name, gotta make sure it matches. And then the name, Attribute is how you identify it to the server, which should be the same here, my F name. And then because it's required, let's use the required field right now, that's the required attribute, and then in quotes you put the value required. And then you close that. That's a self-contained tag, the input element, that form control. So let's look it over. Does that make sense? Input type equal text, ID is my F name, name is my F name, and it is required. I think that looks good. So 
Let's save this thing out though. Save as, and we're going to save it as. Um, this is going to be reservations, correct? So I thought I already had one out here that I wanted to wipe out. There we go. Okay, let's wipe, let's wipe that out. So now let's actually go to the live view. Well, hey, so far so good, right? That looks pretty good. That's my new reservations page, reservations at Pacific Trails. And then I've got a contact us. And then I've got a required first name text box. So far, so good. Let's go back to the code. So I'm going to need the same thing for last name and an email. So let's just kind of grab these things and then paste them here. Control V, Control V. Only now it's not first name, it's going to be last name. So we change the label and we change what's displayed on the form. And it's still a text box. We change the um, ID again that we used in the label and let's change the uh, name of it uh, that the server is going to refer to and it's still required right so does that make sense my last name last name okay ID is still my L name my L name okay and the type is still a text okay the next one is going to be an email address so it tells you in the instructions to Name this field my email. Is that uppercase or lowercase? So I'm looking at item eight now under task three, and it just says to you uppercase E, my email. Okay, so now I have to change the appropriate ID and the appropriate name. I'll have to match here. And then it's also required. And then what they see on the page, e-mail. And these are, these all have colons. So colon, colon, colon. Okay, now, if this is going to be an email, instead of having to type equal text, and again, I'm working ahead a little bit because I think later on in this set of instructions, they tell you to go back and enable this feature. Hey, if it's email, use type equal email and then let the HTML validate the form of that input so it's something at something dot whatever. And these are all required, so that all looks good. So let's save it. Let's go look at it. And let's go to, I want to get rid of the home page. Not get rid of it, just remove it from my um, active session here. And then, okay, that looks pretty good. First name, last name, email and I would have to have it in the appropriate form. I'm gonna test that in a minute. Go back to code view. So now it says under item nine, configure the form control for the phone information, and it tells me to use another text box for that, and then it says to create a text area for a comment, and then to add a submit button, and then to, uh, Test it in the browser before we move forward with task number four. So what do we have to add here? We have to add a phone and we have to have it a text area. So I'm gonna paste this in. And in this one, we're gonna have a label again. Well, it's gonna be now my phone. And then this is not required. So what does the form have on it? It's just phone, right? Phone colon. And then the type is text. ID is my phone. Name has to match my phone, and then it's no longer required, so get rid of that. Okay, now we can leave it a text box, but it's a phone number, isn't it? So let's take advantage of the type that is embedded in HTML5 and say type equal telephone, and it'll make sure that it's numeric input, which I think they ask you to do in a minute anyway, but I'm, I'm impatient. So the last thing we have to do according to the instructions in task three, is to add a text area and a submit button. So let's, and the comments are actually, are actually required, right? You see that in the figure 943. So in this case, it's gonna be, uh, we're still gonna label it. So let's label it and for, um, let's give it a label. How about my comments? And then what actually gets displayed there 
would be asterisk comments because they are required. And then now let's uh, close that label, yeah, rather the opening. Um, already did that. I closed the opening tag for the label. So it's a container tag. So now I have to have a forward slash label to close it. All right. And then we follow the label with the form control, which is uh, a text area. So we have to use the text area element. And then we have to reference it by this ID that I had in the label. So that would be my or lowercase, all case sensitive. My comments, and then the name should be the same. My comments, and then it's required, right? So required equal required. Let's close that, and then a closing tag for the text area. Now, I should specify in here how many rows and how many columns, which I haven't done yet. But what's it look like on the form? It looks like a couple of rows and not an awful lot of columns. So let's put uh, rows equal two, then columns equal, and these numbers have to be in quotes. How about how about 30? Might even be, might not even be that long. It might be like 25. Let's put 25 there. I'm just visually inspecting that. Or did they tell me what to do? Oh, it tells me to set it to 20. I guess I should read the instructions. Okay, two rows, 20 columns. All right, notice Dreamweaver's not complaining about anything. And then at the very last, um, or the very last thing I put inside my form is a way to submit that. So I have to have another form control, so it's an input element. The type is submit, in quotes, lowercase. And then the value is gonna be submit. But I wanna style this with a rule that I set up in my CSS, the Pacific.css mods. Remember that rule, that ID that we created called my submit? Well, this is where we refer to it, ID equal my submit. And this is the one that put the left margin at 10 to make sure it was spaced over appropriately in the form. Okay, so that's all that I'm supposed to do to complete task number three out of chapter nine. So let's save it. And now let's, let's open it. So here it is in the browser. All right, and here's my home page. And here's my yurts page, which we added the table to last week. And then here's the activities page, which didn't change. And now here's my new reservations page. And boom, there it is. Does that look good? I think that looks pretty good. So far, so good. It works. Well, let's check. I can enter whatever there. What about my email? What if I hit submit? Well, no. See, it's going to error check it and say that you're missing the whatever at uh, whatever dot whatever. Now, will it pass? It would, except I have a required comment field. So, hello there. And if I I don't have to put a phone, so I'm not going to, but what if I tried to type in text? Well, it submitted that. Well, it must be an element that's not supported in this version of Chrome. So this went off to the publisher's server and executed the script that was set up to validate our form. And notice all of those name um, attributes that you put in the form controls. And you had values associated with them, Notice the server will refer to the values with those name fields. It's a way to identify the contents of the form. So that's pretty slick. And we just go back. So, so far, so good, right? It works. Now, let's go to task four, and then we're almost done. It says, add a paragraph above the form with the following sentence. Required information is marked with an asterisk. Well, no kidding. I guess I should have thought about that. So underneath our heading three, Let's put a paragraph, opening P, and then what is it? Required, required information. Uh, yeah. Required information is marked with an asterisk. And you have to tell them what the asterisk means. Let's close that tag. Okay. 
So that takes care of that guy. Does it? I don't know. Let's look. Yep, that's good. Now let's go back to code view. So that was item number one under task four, page 446. And now it says use the required attribute to require the first name, last name, email, and comments. Too late. Already did that. I saw it was, it was required, and I put required when we were up in task number three. And then it says configure the input element for the email address with type email. Up ah, too late. I already did that because I knew that was a good thing to do. Task number four, configure the input element for the phone with type equal tell. I oh, already did that because I knew that was a good thing to do. Now, what I actually have to do is insert two new form controls here in item five and six, and then we're done with the form. So in item five says, add a calendar form control to process the reservation using type equal date, and then add a spinner uh, to process a value between 1 and 14 that indicates the number of nights for the length of the stay, and it tells us to use type equal number to get the spinner and then define the min and max values of the range. So that's it. Only two more form controls. So before the comment area, but after the phone is where I'm going to insert these. And all of them should have a label. So the next one would be for the date of arrival. So label and then for, what do we want to call it? How about my date to be consistent with what's above? I think they've been told you to use my date, didn't they? Uh, no, but at this point, we've established a pattern. So, and then we put in the text that's going to be on the form, and it says arrival date, colon. And then that's going to close the label. And then we have to, have to put the form control, the input element. So it's going to be input type equal date. ID equal my date. That's the one we just established in the label. And then name equal, this is what gets sent to the server, my date. Do I need to put anything else in there? Date is the form control type. The ID and the name, that's it. That's all I have to do. So the input element is a self-contained tag. You just close that one. And then the next one, well, let's complain about something. What did I mess up? Label, oops, I forgot an equal sign here. All right, isn't that great? Having Dreamweaver do that rather than just gnash your teeth when it doesn't work right. So when we have our final form control, I'm gonna label this one, and then this one is gonna be um, my nights. Having an equal, and then in quotes, my nights. That's what I'm gonna call it. And then what gets displayed on the form, it just says nights colon, right? I think that's all that's there. Close the label, follow it with a, um, the form control. So it's an input element, and here the type is what? The type here is a spinner, and they tell you to use the keyword number. That's what gives you the spinner form control. Then I have to refer to it with that ID I, I defined in my label. So my nights, and then I need a name that sends it to the server, my nights, and then what am I missing on this one? I have not provided, well, let's look. So I've got the type, right? That's the form type, form control type, yes. Um, the ID and the names match. The ID is referenced in the label, good. I didn't provide the range for the spinner. So they tell us to have a min of one, and that has to be in quotes, and then a max of 14, and again, that has to be in quotes, and then that input tag is self-contained, so we just close it and we're done. I'm pretty sure that's it. Uh, there's nothing else to do here, so let's save it. Let's look at it in live view, and does that look appropriate? I mean, you know, there are little differences in terms of the way the browser implements the spinner and implements the, the calendar feature, but it looks good. So now let's actually go into the browser and test it. So here I am in the browser, which I hope to God is on the share screen and being captured in the recording. So let's refresh this and boom, there it is. Looks good. So what if I just hit submit? Well, no, I have to provide a name. And then what if I hit submit? Well, no, I have to provide a last name. And then what if I hit submit? Well, no, I need an email. What if I type garbage? 
No, it error checks it. Okay, at AOL.com. Do I need a phone? No. Do I need an arrival date? Uh, that's not required, but if I hit submit at this point, it'll say I don't have comment. Hello there. Just for grins, I'll put a phone number in, and um, it should not take text. Let's see what happens. Well, it's not a, it's not a supported feature in this particular version of the browser. So that's what happens when you try to use an HTML5 feature that's not supported in the browser. It just treats it as a text box. So number of nights. Oh, look, there's my spinner and there's my calendar. So let's open up my calendar function. That's cool, right? It allows me to go wherever with the calendar. I open this up and I can go front and back. And then what about the number of nights? I've got a spinner control, right? So I can, can't go below one. I can go up. Now, I've got field. I got values for all these fields. So if I hit submit, it goes off to the server, runs the script, and boom, it'll just echo print the values that got packaged up with that post method and sent over to the server. And it identifies them all with the identifier that you provided using the name attribute when you created these form controls. So first name, last name, email address, phone number not validated, date seems reasonable and um, the value that was returned by the spinner. So it all looks good. It all works, all right? So here's our home page. There's our yurts page with our table from chapter eight. Activities hasn't changed. Reservations is our new page. And notice because we recycled the same structure that we'd already defined in the main, um, you know, it, it's all thematically consistent. All right, so that's all that we needed to cover in Chapter 9. I appreciate you guys spending the time watching the um, overtime edition of the lecture. Uh, the hands-on exercise 5 took a little bit of work, and then creating this form from scratch. I hopefully did an adequate job of explaining that, that process and how to actually implement those features and um, some just general uh, philosophy about how to approach a task of that nature. So if you have any questions about anything, please message me through Canvas. Uh, next week, we're actually going to cover a chapter that just talks about web development, how to properly uh, structure your site, uh, where you might go to find someone to host you, uh, how to establish a domain name. It's a very short chapter. There is no HTML or CSS to write here, but there is a case study exercise that, um, does, again, doesn't require that you do anything with more HTML or CSS with regards to the specific trails running case that we've done week to week, but it does require that you look at the Pacific Trails case study and then using the information in the chapter, develop a test plan, deployment test plan. So although there's no development to do, there is, uh, uh, in, in terms of like writing new HTML and CSS, there is some work to do in terms of how to, the methodology, right? The, how you would approach deploying your and testing your web page to the public. Okay, so any questions, let me know. Thanks for going in the overtime session. Have a great week. We'll see you next week when we cover chapter 10. Thank you.